we are into the investigation process. We hear, we read the, the data, we, we evaluate it. For me, it would be very important to understand what's the next step. What, what, is there any pathogen involved? So we take samples. What, where are the types of diagnostics that we have available? And for me, it's a pleasure to invite my, my friend and colleague, uh, Daniel Linares. He will walk us through this process. Thank you, Carmen. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Good morning. Really happy to be here today. And we are going to talk a little bit about diagnostics and how to get to the root cause of what's going on here. Before that, just would like to take a quick time here to, to thank Dr. Marius Kunzi for orchestrating all this perspective event, also known as MAGE, or the breeding horse in China. You want to talk with him about that and better understand where that comes from. Uh, but uh, anyways, we will dive into what we are going to talk about here today. I would like to remind us that uh, the severity of clinical signs and productivity uh, caused by, by PERS here in the middle, it really depends on a series of factors, including the, the virus itself, right in this blue, in this green uh, bubble. We know that not all PERS variants are, have the same virulence. Dr. Chao Si Lee is going to talk with us about a more virulent uh, uh, strain that they're dealing right now in China as we speak. And we also know that in a lot of cases, we deal with not only one variant, but multiple variants. So it's a soup of PERS viruses in the, in the system, a lot of times because of biosecurity, a lot of times with fa because of factors related to guilt introduction. We're going to talk about both of those today. And, uh, if we shift our gears to the pig uh, circle, we know that there are some factors such as pig age and, and whole, whole uh, herd immunity that also plays a role in the magnitude of per severity. And of course, the yellow bubble is the environmental uh, conditions bubble that includes access to water, access to quality feed, uh, in, uh, te uh, barn temperature, humidity, all that stuff, and also including co-infections. We're going to talk about PCV2 and mycoplasma some uh, today. And the good news is that it may sound complex and complicated, but all of those things can be measured uh, objectively. And we're going to talk about some, some of those uh, yet this morning. So diving into this, in our case, it's a case where we are endemically infected uh, with a few pathogens. And for PERS, uh, some of the talking points are Whenever there is a wild type in our system, it, it is a problem. Having the wild type is just like having a bomb that goes tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. It's going to explode sooner or later. A lot of times when the, uh, we are endemically infected at high prevalence, we, this bomb is going to explode in the site one, in the breeding herd. So we will see aborts, uh, piglet losses, piglets being born weak and all of those first clinical signs. When we are endemically infected, but at a low prevalence, and we are at low prevalence because of herd immunity that lowers the ability of virus to replicate and, and infect, then the breeding herd becomes silent or almost silent, and that bomb is going to explode down in the nursery or finishing depending on, on, on immunity levels and, and some of those uh, cofactors that we talked about. The fact is that when you have wild type, you, you want to watch closely, so you want to sequence, you want to understand which strain I'm, uh, I am dealing with. And again, you may be dealing with more than one strain. And over time, understanding this ecology of, of detection, you will know if you should shift your gears towards biosecurity, avoiding multiple different strains coming in, or biomanagement meaning better control the existing strain in the farm. And we're going to talk about both situations. When we shift a little quick to PCV2, the story is a little bit different. We know that PCV2, we expect to detect the virus pretty much everywhere in all the age groups. And that, that's the, that does not mean that we're seeing PCV2-associated clinical, clinical signs or disease. To understand if PCV2 is really causing uh, problems, we need a diagnostician to help us with histopathology and understand if there are lesions actually associated with the virus. 
A lot of times, the vaccine takes care of the infection. For mycoplasma, usually there's, there, there are maybe some uh, uh, exceptions if we're dealing with a mycoplasma infection in a, na a naive herd, but oftentimes in endemic situations, mycoplasma, it's not a breeding herd problem. It is a grow finish problem, more finishing than, than early grow finish. But we still want to keep, a, keep an eye on mycoplasma as far as the breeding herd is concerned because we know that the prevalence or number of piglets that are infected with mycoplasma at winning, it's a really good predictor of how, how severe mycoplasma disease is going to be. So we want to make sure that the guilds are well vaccinated and the breeding herd is controlled for myco because we're, we care about the grow finish pigs. Diving a little bit deeper here in the case of PERS, just would like to remind that in our specific case, we're endemically infected, low prevalence. Uh, as shown by the numbers from uh, Clayton showed us, the South Farm productivity is, is close to, to normal, and it's, it's pretty common when we have low prevalence PERS. Herd immunity hides the disease in the breeding herd. You may or may not find the virus depending on your selection of sample type, sample frequency, sample size. We're going to talk all about that. But the, that bomb is going to explode, explode later on in the late nursery or sometimes uh, finishing. And uh, we, we always look at the south farm. We always look back at how gilts were acclimated so that the south farm performs well as far as winning purse negative pigs. For PCV2, as we said, the, the pathogen is going to be everywhere, right? So you may detect it by PCR, but that's often not a concern, not if the, the, you don't have pretty low CT values. And uh, to understand if you have PCV2-associated disease, right, beyond just pathogen detection, we need histopathology and clinical observations compatible with this pathogen. Well, the good news is that to investigate all of those, we have what we are calling the population-based monitoring and surveillance system tools. So it's a nice tool set where we don't need to pick pig by pig anymore. In a lot of situations, we can take advantage of this sample. We're going to talk about some of those today, where with very easily, very, in a very practical fashion, you, you collect uh, samples representing hundreds, sometimes thousands of pigs with just a handful of PCRs. So really a cost-effective way to monitor the, 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 the herds for pathogen detection in the top row. And down, uh, in the down row, we have a, a chart demonstrating some uh, uh, monitoring uh, productivity over time. Uh, in this case, demonstrating aborts, but it could be mortality, could be sows that are off feed in the gestation barn, could be aborts, and could be some others. So it's a nice way to, as long as the farm has their productivity data collected and pushed to the cloud, it will be really simple to implement algorithms to detect changes, significant changes in those uh, parameters that are oftentimes early indicators of disease activity. So whenever you have a, a, a spike there in your productivity indicators or uh, sensors-based uh, technology, Carmen talked about the sound talks, is then you, we follow up with uh, oral fluids to, uh, or other diagnostic uh, specimen or other specimen to follow up diagnostics and understand what is the cause of variation. Really quick here on, uh, on sound talks, we were looking at the grow finish pigs for this situation and we see that spike in, in cough. And to, today with automated feeding, automated water lines and everything, it's pretty hard to justify caretakers in individual barns, individual uh, rooms, taking care of pigs for more than a few hours per day. And that's what sound talks does for for us, it's, it's really uh, monitoring the pigs in a 24 hours per day, seven days a week, uh, a week, including weekends and holidays. So it's a nice way to really keep an eye on pigs uh, on a continuous fashion. Whenever there is a signal, you follow up with your diagnostics and understand what's, what's, what, what are the pathogens associated with that spike in respiratory uh, distress. So in summary here so far, we are seeing 
from what Clayton uh, uh, described, from what Carmen uh, saw, from though that the, there is a problem, respiratory problem in grow finish. This respiratory problem is associated with uh, slow growth, is associated with uh, uh, survivability of those, those pigs. And com coming back to the south farm, the south farm is back to baseline, and that's pretty normal. Like Clayton said, that's completely uh, a, a nor normal case. You have low prevalence situation in the south farm, and then uh, the disease is, is hidden uh, until the maternal immunity wanes, and then the, the pigs get sick in the, in the finishing. Whenever we have that problem, and again, pretty, pretty typical common problem um, uh, among v v uh, different producers, the long-term solution is not at finishing. The long-term solution is not going to be at finishing. That doesn't mean we shouldn't take care of those pigs. There will be health interventions we, we, we have to implement in those pigs to help them. But if you want to help the future flows, uh, we really we got to ride and back to the south farm, fix the south farm, and so that the future f finishing cohorts have, have a better uh, chance of, of, uh, of reaching their genetic, full genetic potential. So with this in mind, quick question for you. Uh, time to pick up the phones again and uh, answer another one. When do I use the different sample types to understand if the farm is stable or not? In other words, uh, leaking wild type virus or not? We have uh, four options for you. So we've done that before. Scan and play. I like this perspective because a lot of conferences, they say, you turn off your phones. Here we say, hey, pick up your phone and <laughs> help us crack the case. Option A, always collect all sample types, spend money. Option B, alternate sample types every week. Today, processing fluids, next week, tongue tips, the following week, family oral fluids, and so on and so forth. Option C, I don't know, just flip a coin and go, go with what you find. Or D, start with processing fluids, then family oral fluids at winning, and use tongue tips if processing fluids is results, you don't agree with that or it doesn't make sense. Awesome. So I'm still flipping a coin, but I'm a, uh, uh, <laughs> the great majority is going with D. And we would agree with that, and let's, uh, let's talk about why. So here is a proposed, we're calling decision tree, Marius, right? Uh, uh, or flow on how to select the sample types for this, these specific herds, like in this case, uh, that went through an outbreak and then are transitioning from high prevalence to low prevalence with the goal of being stable meaning producing, consistently producing wind pigs that are negative for the wild type. So we would start up in the top with a screening PCR with, fem with, sorry, with processing fluids. If for those herds that don't castrate pigs at processing physically or that don't collect processing fluids for a reason, tongue tips from the first week of life would be a good uh, alternative with very, very similar results. So you keep screening and testing aggregated pools uh, for weekly PCR, collecting from as many liters as possible, all the rooms if possible, aggregate them in a bag and send for PCR, and keep testing. If the expected results are positive, but, but expected, right, the, the chances are that the first several weeks, couple months after the outbreak, the samples are going to test positive and that's expected, you keep monitoring. And you keep monitoring when it's expected to be positive because you want to look at the CT values, right, the, Quantitate, qu quantitation here of the assay and make sure that those CTs have indication that the trend is it's going up towards negativity. 
If it's going up towards negativity, you keep monitoring, you keep, you keep uh, 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 working on this loop until uh, they're negative or if they're positive but not expected because it's positive for way too long. It's 25 weeks and I'm still having seen some low CTs. Then you want to ask, where's that virus coming from? Is it from the breeding herd? The sows are giving birth to positive pigs or are they coming from the older piglets when with the processes of cross fostering and, and uh, moving pigs between crates and rooms and nursing sows and, and everything that's going on, uh, I mean actually infecting the piglets. So you, to answer that question, we collect tongue tip fluids from the stillborn pigs. So we also collect the stillborn uh, tongue tips from those stillborn pigs from every stillborn pigs, every, every room, every crate to get a great representativeness. You put them in bags, disposable bags of 20 to 100 tongue tips per bag. If you fill that, that bag, you go to another one. But then you submit that through PCR for testing. If it's positive, then it's, it's pretty simple. Stillborn pigs don't commingle with others, right? They, they were stillborn. So if they are positive, our interpretation is it's coming from the sow herd. So if it's the sow herd is not stable yet, either it needs more time to, for herd immunity to build, or depending on their situations and the wild type detection in the, in the breeding herd, depending on what your whole genome sequence is going to tell you, you, you may want to immunize the herd again to build that immunity stronger. Uh, and you keep doing that until they are negative. Once they are negative, while your stillborns are negative, but your processing fluid is still positive, the answer is really simple, and, and uh, you, you're giving birth to negative piglets, but they are getting infected during those first week of life with a lot of busy activities going on in the barn. So the message should be pretty straightforward, strict biomanagement to keep piglets negative, right? And then implementing this in a matter of a couple of weeks, the processing fluid should become negative if the answer is really biomanagement. So we keep monitoring that until we are negative. When those are negative for a few weeks, the chances are it's going to be negative, bounce back to positive. Don't hit the panic button just yet. That's pretty normal. The intermittent detection when you're at low prevalence. Once you're f a few weeks negative, you're going to pull a little bit less, maybe one processing fluids per, per, per room of about 60 crates or so. Then if they're still negative, you check the winners. That's the moment of, 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 of truth here for your per status. Uh, the winning age piglets, you could either collect family or fluids with those, or if you, if, if you prefer and if you have all in, all out, single flow, nursery flows, you can throw some oral fluids there and, and test the winning age piglet population. When they are negative for 13 consecutive weeks, according to the American Association of Swine Vet Standard, the herd is then declared stable, meaning consistently winning negative pigs, right? And then, but if it's positive, you're positive on processing fluids and negative here, or oh, sorry, oh, it's still positive on family or fluids, then you're transmitting, helping. It's not the sows anymore. Now it's, uh, it's we, the humans, with moving pigs and people around, and we are moving the virus around. So strict biomanagement, right? Similar to over here. So the message should be also straightforward and should bring the herd back to negative soon after implementing those biomanagement strategies. We're going to talk more about biomanagement strategies in the afternoon. So back to our case. More diagnostic findings here. The producer sent some of, uh, so, some of those samples for us. There were a couple of sows aborting in the gestation barn, some serum and material from a, a, a pulled abdominal content from fetuses. We collect five or six of those and pull and send for PCR. Negative for PCV2 and parvo, that's good. Positive for PERS. And you go, okay, let's, what, what else? Both processing fluids and tongue tips with consistent results where the, the guilt leaders, the leaders from those parity one sows, they are positive uh, with lower CTs than uh, the, the, the older parity sows for PERS. They are also positive for PCV2, but kind of high, high CT, so not, nothing of, of concern there. Again, PCV2 will only be a problem with CTs 
in the mid to or, or low low twenties. So PERS a problem, and we that, that, that there is evidence here that uh, the breeding herd is still leaking a little bit of virus, uh, especially the gilt uh, leaders because of those tongue tip results. And then uh, not, not a surprise if it's positive here, the winning age piglets are also uh, positive. And uh, since we are collecting oral fluids for PERS, why not test for MYCO2? And uh, as a surprise, it's also positive for, for mycoplasma. So another yellow alert here to further investigate mycoplasma. Well, the good news is that mole uh, genetic sequencing reveals a 98% similar virus to the virus that was sequenced at the beginning of the outbreak. So biosecurity seems to be working for this farm. And, and uh, there is no evidence of new virus, at least at this point. And so got to go back to, to biomanagement. So preliminary conclusions here from everything we have seen so far. PCV2, nothing unexpected in terms of diagnostic testing results. PERS, vertical transmission active. There is evidence based on those tongue tips from stillborn piglets. No evidence of new virus introduction based on their sequencing. Focus on herd immunity and practices to reach stability. We're going to talk more about that in the afternoon. And guilt, it's really a red alert. Clayton is going to really dive deep into, the, into how to, to perfect that guilt acclimation also later, later today. And mycoplasma is also a yellow alert, right, with those oral fluids being uh, revealing some mycoplasma activity in the winning age piglet population. And so when we're talking about guilt acclimation for PERS, also ask, hey, Dr. Johnson, how about mycoplasma too? And he's going to help us understand how to acclimate for both. Back to the future too. Why? Because we, went, we were in the finishing and realized, oh, the problem is not in the finishing. The long-term solution is in the south farm. We came to the south farm. Let's make the south farm stable. Diagnostics reveal you're close to stable, but your, your guilds are leaking. So there's some things we can do in the, fair, in the breeding herd. Yes, of course. We're going to talk about that in the afternoon. But the real long-term solution is with the guild population. So back to the future and to, to fix that problem in the nursery and more of that later uh, today with, uh, with Clayton. And I would like to remind that the sow health, it's really, there's no such a thing as just a sow farm health. It's a, it's a continuum between the guild and the sow. And no matter if you have your GP, GGPs, your, 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 your self-replacement going on in the farm, or if you purchase the guilt from an outside farm, the chances are these guilds are being raised somewhere. Again, it could be on site or, or off site, but they are somehow leaving the breeding herd airspace and being uh, raised somewhere and coming back. And we, we are only going to perform as far as health is concerned. Uh, at a full, our full potential, full potential, when those guilds are both developed well and acclimated well, right? The, the, those two key, key terms, guild development, think, uh, thinking about how do we select those guilds as, as early as when they are born, how do we raise them for optimum uh, growth performance, not the fastest, it's the other way around, Gr rate, uh, grow in a in a, in, a, in, a, in a right pace for a guilt, which is not a finisher, and prepare that re in repro uh, reproduct re for her reproductive career, right? And the guilt acclimation, which is what we're going to focus, is more about the health aspect. Is the guilt immunized? Is the guilt uh, uh, negative for those pathogens we think it's negative? Does it have enough immunity for those that we need, right, for the endemic situations in, the, in, in our breeding herd? so on and so forth. And uh, if, if I could summarize what we want with the guilds is I'm going to use two terms that I learned with uh, Reed Phillips f a, f a while back. He would say, since Jesus was a little boy, and those two words are very true, are the guilds should come in endemic herds, right? In endemic herds, which is our case, it should, they should come immunized and non-shedding. And I highlighted here for you so that it's clear the guilds should be immunized and non-shedding. If they're not immunized, 
they will become infected and they will amplify the virus. And that's, that's, that's what's going on based on what we saw in the diagnostics. They're going to get a little bit of virus that's low prevalence in the herd and they're going to amplify that. And if they are partially immunized, they not completely immunized, they, they will also bring some wild type or some, some stuff to the farm and they, it's the other way around. They will become a source of infection in, to, to, the, to the cells that may be stable. So remember that guilds should be immunized and non shedding, ideally three months, no less than two months before they get into the breeding herd so that they can really develop that protective solid immunity and quit shedding before they come. Here a table that we prepared for, for you. It's in, the, it's in the book with uh, suggestions on how to monitor the guilt population for Pers and Michael. And long story short, you throw your oral fluids in the guilt pens and test that for PCR uh, for both. Always P PCR because it's an endemic situation. They're going to be immunized. So the ELISA will have little value in our specific case. You look at, at PCR. It's true to say that mycoplasma for oral fluids for mycoplasma is not the most sensitive, but since we are collecting uh, oral fluids for PERS, we can also test for myco. And if you were in a case that you were a multiplier or genetic nucleus wanted additional assurance, you can always go with tracheal swab PCR, and there is the sample size for you too. So back to the future three. Now, we, from, the field, from the finishing pigs, we went back to the sow farm. The sow farm, we went back to the finishing. Clayton is going to uh, uh, help us understand what specifically we do in, with that guild pool to pamper our princess. And now that everything will be fixed, now you can go back to the, to the finishing pigs, and they'll be just doing just fine, even laughing if they can. 